marketing is trying to convince someone to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do. Good marketing is turning that behavior into a habit. And propaganda is turning that habit into a culture. This sounds like some buzzword line you'd hear from the likes of Malcolm Gladwell or Seth Godin, but it's actually something I came to realize while working on my final project for the Contemporary Design course at the University of West Florida, also known as the documentary you are currently watching. After collecting some samples, buying a few books, and doing a lot of research, I've put together what I believe to be the first vertically filmed documentary discussing where marketing ends and propaganda begins, if there is a line at all, and whether it is morally right for us as marketers to cross it. Whether you're a company trying to sell a product, a nonprofit looking for donors, or a group trying to call attention to a cause, everyone is trying to get someone else to do something. In that way, marketing is really just the art of persuasion. This documentary is going to discuss marketing in both design and in art, though we're going to focus on the former. Both are integral in developing culture, which is why I want to touch on both, but they do fulfill very different roles. While art is focused on making you think or feel in new and innovative ways, design is more focused on solving a problem. It can clearly be seen how both would be related to the art of persuasion, but that distinction between the two is important, and it's going to come up later. Across both art and design, the art of persuasion can be generally split into two categories, marketing towards pleasure and marketing against pain. Let's start with the former, pleasure. We all know what it is, but how we define it is highly subjective. Few sensations are universally pleasurable, if any, which makes marketing towards pleasure a delicate song and dance of trying to determine what your customer wants and how you're going to get that for them. There are a million ways you can market towards pleasure, but for the sake of this, we're going to focus on one example, female archetypes. The female figure has always been seen as a pleasure to view. It has been a popular design trope across art movements, including ancient Greek, neoclassicism, and realism, just to name a few. The goal of this design property is for you to indulge in the woman just as much as you indulge in the product. However, the way men and women view these advertisements is very different, and thus those advertisements are tailored to their unique viewpoints. For example, when men view these ads, they think, sexy women like this product, so if I get this product, I will get sexy women. This contrast with what women think when they see these ads. They think, sexy women like this product, so if I have this product, I will be a sexy woman. While both are unique thought processes, they both still market towards pleasure, through desire. Marketing towards pleasure is a useful tool marketers use to convince people to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do. However, you can't use a hammer to do a drill's job. That is to say, marketers need more than one tool in their toolbox in order to build an effective marketing strategy. And that is where pain comes in. Pain and pleasure are similar in that they are both universally understood, but not universally defined. It is especially hard to use pain in marketing because for many, the act of spending money itself is a painful process. However, marketing against pain can be a relatively easy two-step process that gets used a lot more often than you think. First, you are made to confront the pain. Feel it. Understand what that feeling means and feel it all over again. This can be spending money or dealing with a problematic other, whether it's someone the customer interacts with directly or not. Then they explain how this product, service, or action will make this pain go away. Don't like spending money? We have weekly deals to save you money. Don't like unsafe drivers? 
They hate me too, so I'll advocate for you. Don't like deadly monsters. Together, we bring peace. Examples of this are everywhere, both in traditional product and services marketing and in art and cultural exhibits. However, there's one thing to keep in mind when dealing with pleasure and pain in the art of persuasion. They aren't mutually exclusive. Pain and pleasure are two sides of the same coin and as such can be spent at the same time. A great example of this is a recent advertisement from Domino's which markets towards pleasure and away from pain in the same promotion. They do this by marketing towards pleasure in making you feel like a superhero for what is a mundane task. They then market against pain by offering a promotion to save you money the next time that you visit. In this way, they make you feel even more like a superhero because you are both deflecting pain and feeling pleasure. These are all examples of how marketing is designed to convince you to do something you wouldn't otherwise do. But how can you tell any of it's actually going to work? How do you turn a behavior into a habit? You repeat it consistently. You may have heard that it takes 21 days to form a habit, but forming habits is much more complicated than that. According to a recent article from Psychology Today, the human brain needs some sort of fuel to keep pushing forward to nurture a behavior into a habit. There are many ways that you can accomplish this, but I'm going to focus on three of the most common. Seasonal products, maintenance, and addiction. What do you think of when I say Valentine's Day? Chocolate? Okay, what do you think of when I say Halloween? Chocolate. And Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa? All different forms of chocolates and sweets. But while all of these holidays make you think of the same general idea of sugary snacks, you likely don't imagine the same chocolates. Good marketing requires you to find your niche. If you try to market to everyone, you market to no one. Alan Dibb phrases this perfectly in his book, The One Page Marketing Plan, where he says, your goal is to be a problem solver, a pain reliever, and to turn any comparison with your competition into an apples to oranges comparison. That's what the chocolate industry is doing. They are redesigning their product to fit the season's demands, so that you buy chocolate all year round while thinking it's just for the season. The second type of product is usually a service because it involves something that needs to be continually maintained. This includes things like car maintenance, hair salons, and arguably fast food restaurants. The goal of these establishments is to be in the back of your mind so the next time you need this maintenance it's done, you go to their firm. Great example of this is Coca-Cola, who spams you with advertisements seemingly everywhere, so that the next time you're thirsty, you might grab their drink over a competitor's. They will also market to niche groups and try to bond into the community so that they feel like a community member and you will be more likely to patron them. Great example of this is also Coca-Cola, with this vintage bottle that I got from an estate sale, celebrating 75 years of naval aviation. This was bottled in Pensacola, Florida, which is famously known as the Annapolis of the Air. Makes sense that they would be attributing naval aviation in a town well known for NAS. Finally, there is a more unethical way to get people to buy your product repeatedly. Addiction. One of the most famous or perhaps infamous applications of this is with cigarette brands. According to the Center for Disease Control, the three most advertised brands are Marlboro, Newport, and Camel. And they are also the three most popular brands with middle and high school students as of 2016. In recent years, cigarette and e-cigarette brands have been accused of marketing towards younger and younger demographics in order to get people hooked early. Tobacco-free kids, an advocacy group fighting against these practices, 
compares candy and e-cigarette advertising to show just how similar the two industries' marketing practices are to one another. Now, these three ways are not the only ways that you can turn a behavior into a habit, but they are some of the most common. However, a lot of marketing that is designed to build habits has a larger ultimate goal, becoming part of the culture. What is culture? There's a lot of ways you could define it, but I'm going to define it thusly. Take a population and average it. That average person is the culture of your population. When you want something to change, you need to convince that 51% to agree with what you want them to believe. That's where the art of persuasion comes in. When you're trying to convince that 51%, that's when marketing becomes propaganda. The great thing about propaganda is that it is a very powerful tool, but the awful thing about propaganda is that it is a very powerful tool. It can be used as both a force for good and for evil, but where it gets interesting is where it gets ugly. For the sake of covering all of these examples, we're going to be covering propaganda through these three lenses. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Most people can agree that recycling's a pretty good thing to do. That's why many brands have recently been trying to increase the recyclability of their products to increase sales and company goodwill. Some market towards pleasure by showing off their sustainable and elegant packaging, though most market against pain by showing the negative effects of global warming on wildlife, people, products, and the environment. These advertisements collectively build a culture that promotes sustainability and environmental conscientiousness. That's why when I ask you, what are the three R's, you likely respond, reduce, reuse, recycle. That is when marketing creates a culture. And that is when we cross the line into propaganda. Much like how we can generally agree that sustainability is a good thing, most can agree that war is very much the opposite. In order to convince their people that they are fighting on the side of good, countries will use propaganda to fuel nationalism and patriotism. Because war is a pain that we don't want to suffer, this marketing focuses on the horrible outcome that will happen should we lose the war. They will start by making you confront this pain, usually by identifying a problematic other using racist ideologies. During World War II, countries tried to spur patriotism and nationalism using strategies straight from Edward Bernays' book, Propaganda, which was published in 1928 and is commonly believed to be the book to popularize the term in the modern day. Two groups that were commonly targeted were Jewish people in German propaganda and Japanese people in American propaganda. These advertisements will then say the only way to prevent this horrible thing from happening is to go to war or enlist or donate resources. It's very effective, but it is also why the word has such a negative connotation in the modern day. Because propaganda was used for such dehumanizing practices, people now believe any use of propaganda should be stopped. And that's where things get ugly. When the morality behind a cause is obvious, it's easy to determine if propaganda is good or evil. However, when that morality is unclear, that's when things get ugly. Before going further, this section is going to be talking about political campaigns and causes. I'm going to be discussing them objectively and focusing on the marketing practices themselves, not the morality of the political positions. The point of this section is that these are divisive topics, and I realize putting this on the internet is a risky move, but I feel like this is something we really need to talk about, especially in the modern day. Because one great example of this recently has been the LGBTQ movement. Some could argue that pride parades, drag shows, and other social events are propaganda trying to boost LGBT representation, visibility, and rights. 
For those against these causes, the use of propaganda is a negative force in their community, and they will fight with dissent, propaganda of their own, and even laws. Those in support of the movement are obviously going to be going to these events, running these events, and promoting them. And that's where that ugly fight comes, when you have that split in the culture right on that 50% line. And this is the case for a lot of political movements in the modern day. I was recently in Washington DC for a business trip to Blue Shark Digital, a digital marketing company based in the nation's capital. While there, I took the time to visit the Renwick Gallery, where every art piece was more than just art. It was propaganda. It was a collection of visually persuasive pieces designed to get you to think about the world differently with hopes of changing the culture. This giant quilt called The Queer Houses of Brooklyn in the three towns of Brookellen, Broswick, and Midwout during the 41st year of the Stonewall era by L.J. Roberts is more than just a tribute to the LGBT movement, but uses other propaganda symbols such as the pink triangle from Nazi iconography and takes what was a hate symbol and turns it into a point of pride. These faux leather appliances by Margarita Cabrera call out exploited human labor in other countries, specifically seamstresses in her home country of Mexico. Even Janet Eckelman's 1.8 Renwick, which just looks like an excuse to lay on the floor and look at pretty nets, is about the Tohoku earthquake that made sunsets longer by 1.8 seconds. It is a commentary on time, on consumerism, on gay culture in America, that this present moment used to be an unimaginable future. This propaganda is designed to make you think in new and innovative ways, and that's where the blurry line between art and design comes into focus. They're both playing with the art of persuasion, they're just doing it in different ways. Art is focused on making you think differently, to go through new thought processes, while design is more focused on solving a problem, and sometimes that problem is knowing that there's a problem in the first place. Artists and designers alike can both use propaganda as an incredibly useful tool to convince people to do, to think, and to feel differently than they otherwise would. The ugly part of propaganda is also extremely beautiful. It can be a force for good, for evil, and for all the messy ethics in between. So what makes it different from marketing? In my opinion, the only difference between marketing and propaganda is how many minds you're trying to change. At the end of the day, marketing versus propaganda is just a matter of the art of persuasion. Thank you for watching my documentary based on the differences between marketing and propaganda. I'd like to thank my professor, Dr. Herring, for helping me through this project, as well as my mom and sister for helping me get clips of this piece, and my friends for critiquing my script. If you liked this video, please like it to let me know I did a good job, and comment below if there's any other topics you would like me to cover. With any photos or videos not taken by me, uh, I did cite them throughout the video, but I will also have a blog on my website. This video will be on there, as well as a PDF of all of my references. And I should be able to have my references below in the description box as well. So if you have any questions about anything in this documentary, feel free to email me at digitalrenaissancewoman at gmail.com. And with that, we are done! So thank you for watching, and until next time, cheers!